Welcome to FPNA Storytelling with Data. We are really excited to have everybody here. Um, this webinar is sponsored by Data Rails, which is a financial planning and analysis platform for Excel users. It automates data consolidation, reporting, and planning, while enabling finance teams to continue using their own Excel spreadsheets and financial models. And we are so excited to have some really fantastic panelists here to talk about data-driven storytelling for finance. So let me introduce you to our panelists. We've got Jordan Goldmeyer. Jordan, wave, hello. Hello, hello everyone. <laughs> Jordan is an internationally recognized analytics and data visualization expert and a nine-time Microsoft MVP who literally wrote the book on Excel dashboards. He's the author, co-author of Becoming a Data Head, How to Think, Speak, and Understand Data Science, Statistics, and Machine Learning, Advanced Excel Essentials, and Dashboards for Excel, as well as the forthcoming second edition of Data Smart. Pretty impressive already. He is also a consultant and speaker who once used Excel to save the Air Force $60 million. Pretty good. Um, <laughs> and we've got Christian Wadig. Hey, Christian. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to have you. Christian grew up in Germany and moved to New York City in 2013. He has held FP&A and finance leadership roles at Procter & Gamble, Unilever, and Squarespace. You may have heard of a couple of those companies. And at the same time, he also discovered his passion for teaching. He led the learning and development team at Unilever and now runs his own course called FP&A Bootcamp, which teaches financial planning and analysis skills to finance teams and business leaders. And Christian is also an FP&A solution architect here at DataRails. And we've got Annette DeYoung. Hey, Annette. Hey, happy Tuesday, everybody. <laughs> Annette is an FB&A Solutions Consultant at Data Rails and a former director of financial planning at specialty packaging manufacturer, JL Clark. With over 20 years of experience as an accounting executive, focusing on budgeting, forecasting, and statistical analysis. After our discussion, Annette will be demonstrating how finance teams can implement some of the dashboarding and visualization skills we'll be talking about. And now, as we're about to kick off our discussion, um, we, we want to hear from you. We want to do a really quick poll to find out what you guys um, hope to learn. So I'm going to launch the poll. So the question is, what do you most hope to learn from this webinar on FP&A storytelling with data? see a lot of you are answering keep going Ooh, there's definitely a leader here it's got about 60 percent of the answers so far okay a few more seconds and then i'm going to turn off the poll okay i'm ending the poll Um, and yes, how to improve data storytelling at my organization is definitely leading the pack here. I may not be the world's leading expert on data analysis, but I can tell you that. Um, and next up is how to get started on storytelling with data, why storytelling with data is important for FPNA, and what storytelling with data is. Well, I have good news for all of you, which is that we are going to be touching on all those things right now. And now for the first question for our panel. Okay, guys. I think everyone here has probably heard a lot about storytelling with data. But let's find out what, how do you define storytelling with data and why do you think it is so important? Jordan, why don't you start? Sure. So, um, you know, the way I would look at it is anytime you apply a narrative to the data that you have, you are doing some sort of data storytelling. So we would all like, oh, the story speaks for itself, the data speaks for itself. And certainly when done well, I think that that is true. Anytime you do some sort of analysis or you have a result, though, you have to present it to someone. And the process of presenting it is actually data storytelling. But if there's not a game plan behind it, 
if people have not been trained in how to do this, they may not do it well and they think, oh, well, we don't do it well. So it's not surprising to me that many organizations would like to improve it for themselves or how to get better because I think on some level, they already know that they're doing it every single day. Um, so that's, that's how I would answer that. Okay, thanks. And that, what about you? Yeah, so just really to add on to what Jordan said, I think with data storytelling, the one thing that I learned over my career was really um, know your audience. <laughs> know your audience because what really makes sense to you, you know, finance and accounting, this makes perfect sense to me. Depending on who you're reporting out to, um, it could look like a completely, you know, foreign concept to somebody else. So in addition to telling that story and having that narrative and maybe having that balance, think about who your audience is while you're developing that as well. Yeah, so Jordan's saying, you know, we, we're already telling these stories all the time. And Annette is warning us to keep the audience in mind because not everybody is um, gonna click with those numbers in the same way. What about you, Christian? Yeah, so I think that the goal of a financial presentation is to have a discussion about how to take action and drive the business forward, right? So if you're going through your presentation and at the end, everyone in the room just nods politely and they move on to the next topic, that's not what we want, right? In a way, it doesn't mean it means that you failed. You want people to discuss uh, actions they plan to take away from your work. And that's why financial storytelling is so important. And the way I look at it, I divide it in three parts, what analysis, story, and then visualization, right? First step is the analysis. You need to make sure to separate signal from noise and turn raw data into insights. And we do that by giving context to the numbers and asking a number of why questions to really drill down into the data. And then the second step is turning it into a story because as you know, people have been telling stories to each other for thousands of years. Why? Well, because our brain really is wired to engage with stories and find stories interesting. And when people find something interesting, then they remember it and then they're more likely you know, to put it into action. And then the third step of data storytelling is put it at all, putting it all on digital paper, right? Creating the slides of your presentation. And here you need to make sure to get the right visualizations that really tell the story and importantly, that don't distract. You know, you don't want to add additional information that isn't needed and less is more in this case. So uh, that's how you keep people engaged. And so in a nutshell, really storytelling with data for me comes down to having an analysis that gets you to the root cause as a starting point and then sharing the insights as a complete story that uses effective visuals. Thanks, Christian. So basically we are kind of, we're wired for stories. We're also kind of wired to think that nodding along is good. And what you're saying is it's okay maybe, <laughs> but it's not the be all and end all because nodding along isn't enough. We also need to actually take action based on, on this data. Awesome. Okay, I'm going to launch another poll before we get to the second question. Okay, this question is, I wanted to check with everyone here. Have you ever had trouble experiencing the significance of your company's financials to non-finance stakeholders? That kind of speaks to what Annette was saying about know your audience, right? Because if your audience is not from the finance world, then you might have some trouble. And if any of you have questions as we're uh, you know, talking here, feel free to put them in the Q&A. We'll, we'll be having a Q&A at the ends of the webinar. Um, and we have somebody from our customer success team who can uh, provide some answers to the Q&A during the webinar. So feel free to ask your questions. Okay, keep answering. I'm gonna close the poll in a few more seconds. Okay, I'm ending the poll. Okay, so we've got, people are kind of clustered in the middle here. So some, some of you have occasionally had trouble explaining the numbers or fairly often, and a few of you all the time. And a few people, I don't know if you're really telling the truth or not, but there are a few people here who say rarely or never. Okay. 
Um, and now for the panel. So we talked a little bit just now about what data storytelling is. And now we really want to get into the meat of things. And here's some real life examples from your personal experience. So can you give us an example of a time where the value of storytelling really hit home? And this could be a time where maybe you only showed your spreadsheet and then realize this isn't enough. People are you know, just nodding, but they're not really processing what I'm saying. Or a time when you actually did build a story around graphs or a dashboard and it, it really hit home and spoke to the audience more. Um, so uh, why don't we flip the order? Christian, why don't you start? Sure, I'm happy to share an example from my course, FPNA Bootcamp. It's, um, it's a live course delivered via Zoom. There are four workshops and the first workshop is dedicated to uh, financial storytelling. And there I share an example from that I've seen in, in, in my, in, during my time leading FPNA teams. And we work through this example. It's a slide that is uh, a bad example, actually. That's really not how you should do it. And then we walk through how you can improve it and get to a slide that really tells the story well. So uh, on the slide, um, there's the, the idea is you want to look at revenue. You know, why was revenue lower than expected last month? You show revenue, but there are a number of other metrics on the slide as well. For example, marketing expenses, right? The slide shows that marketing expenses are higher than planned. And that's an example that, um, that really shows you, you need to be careful what you put on the slide and what can distract. So marketing expenses in this case, you know, you may think, oh, wow, that's a, of course, there's a direct link to revenue. So why not include that? But um, if it's slightly higher than planned, that there are some issues there. One, it could be that it's not really related to the current month. Marketing expenses could come into play later. Or since it's higher than planned, really, you need to take a closer look at the ROI behind the different um, activities. And so you may get questions that you can't really answer with the slide. So it's better to put that on a different side. And when I saw the slide for the first time in a, in a big meeting, you know, in, in, in a prior role, um, I immediately noticed how people frowned, they stared, and they tried to understand what the slide was actually telling them because there was so much going on there. And that it was immediately clear to me that they couldn't really listen to what the presenter was saying, meaning, you know, you lost the audience. And um, that's really what you want to avoid. And it's how you can tell that your storytelling maybe wasn't successful. And then next, I show my students how a number of slides that tell the story well, where nothing distracts, and the visualization clearly highlights the one thing people need to take away from the slide. And by comparing that to how it was before and showing kind of the before and after, you can really see how um, the power of storytelling, right? And how being clear and concise to the point, but still telling a complete story is um, the way to succeed with financial presentations. Okay. So I got paying attention to body language is important, right? Before you talked about nodding, nodding is okay, but not enough. Um, and frowning and staring are bad, <laughs> and and highlighting one thing. Uh, Jordan, what do you have to say about that? I mean, I think those are all great concepts. My story is um, slightly different. So um, I had a big client and I worked on this dashboard for them. And I can't really get too much into what it did, but like in Excel, it had kind of levers and stuff and they would set this and that, and then it would come up with scores from zero to one, for the different metrics that they wanted. So hypothetically, you know, from a theoretical standpoint, it made sense. But when people sat down to interpret what it did, because I would, you know, they'd say, try this and that, then it would go to like, let's say you would see like something shoot up to a 0.8. And then they have a debate about well, what does that really mean? Which I think as Christian was saying is like a good thing. But what I didn't have was a narrative. I didn't put guardrails on it. So everyone kind of interpreted it in their own way. And so it's kind of like at that point, you're reading it like tea leaves. And, you know, you're not really like everyone can just sort of see their own fortune in it. Um, and I think that it really did need something more grounded and specific. So while I had the technical aspects of it right, I didn't have a story behind it they could fall back on that would frame their evaluation of it, whatever that's worth. 
Right. So I, I think that's like the, even if the data analysis and the numbers make sense to finance people, that it's not necessarily going to make sense without that story and it's leaving it too open to interpretation. Yeah. And that, what about you? Yeah. And, and kind of the same thing. And this is where like, I really focused later in my career on my audience um, earlier on in my career in finance and accounting, just trying to report out numbers, you know, this is how you're doing in your department, for instance, um, you would get that glazed over look like, and I was a math major, by the way. So it's like, I was trying to explain how to solve for Euclidean algorithm or something, right? <laughs> they had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. And, and I'm like, okay, I had to go back because really it was a spreadsheet, right? I mean, early on in the days, we didn't really have the visualizations. We didn't have the great tools that we have today. And so it was a spreadsheet. It was messy. Everything kind of ran together. I understood it 120% because I created it, you know, so you get lost in the details. And I think sometimes a little too much because you know the story, you know the details behind the numbers, but your audience doesn't necessarily understand. So simpler, right? Make it a lot more simple, visually, number one, right? And, and two, I think, as Krishna said, you know, that whole nodding, the other thing that is, if nobody asks questions, they don't understand it especially when you're in a big room full of people, right? Everybody's looking at each other like, do you understand this? Yeah, I understand it. Do you understand it? Yeah, I understand it. <laughs> Nobody's going to raise their hand and go, whoa, 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 what exactly does this mean, right? Having those one-on-ones and, and training, especially training for anything new that you're going to present to a group. Send it out early and say, you know, pick a couple of people and say, look, this is kind of, you know, what I'm going to present does this make sense to you? What doesn't make sense to you? And then you can kind of hone that craft to make sure that you are reporting out in a way that number one makes sense and people are going to be engaged, right? They're not going to be afraid to ask questions. A lot of times they don't when they really truly don't understand what you're presenting. Okay. So I'm getting from kind of all of you, like pay attention to what your audience is is doing and how they're reacting, right? Are they glazed over? Are they asking questions? And to Jordan's point, what kind of questions are they asking? Are they just like asking the questions, but kind of interpreting it however they want? Or are they kind of clicking into the story that you're presenting um, and interpreting it like the way that that makes sense to you as the person who kind of owns the data and knows what it means? Okay, awesome. Um, I'm going to launch another poll. And while you're doing that, I yeah. see some questions have come in. Do you mind if I attempt to answer one of them? Or... Yeah, go for it, Jordan. So I, so, sure. So I see um, uh, Jeremy. I'm also launching the poll at the same time. So if you can listen and respond, that would be perfect. <laughs> yeah. So, um, you know, I see he asked, uh, how do you do separate presentations for different audiences? My answer to that is usually I just do one big one. Usually there's like, I have like a big, small, like, um, I should say large, medium, and small. Small is the two slide one, medium is four or five slides. Large one could be as large as I want. And then, you know, usually I just build the big one first and then just cut cut things down to size for the different audiences. Yeah, I, I, I'm familiar with that because, uh, you know, sometimes like you just want to dump it all onto the page and it can actually take more work to, you know, shorten it, tighten it, figure out what to focus on. Sure. And, you know, just don't be afraid to get it wrong. You know, just if, if people nod, <laughs> then just like go back and fix it, you know, just, just keep improving it if you can. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Ron. Uh, I'm closing the poll in a few seconds, a few more seconds to answer. Okay. I'm closing the poll and sharing the results. Okay, so the question is, what would most help you with data storytelling? Um, so our winner here, not as a, as overwhelming a winner as some of the other poll answers, but 33% of you said easy to use dashboarding and visualization tools. 25% um, of you said improved ability to explain the narrative. 23% said dashboarding tools that integrate with existing data systems. And 19% of you said better data that's cleaner, more relevant, or more accessible. Okay. 
And now we're going to ask our panel, um, what would most, oh, sorry, that was the poll question. Okay, what's the biggest obstacle? I am jumping ahead, sorry about that. Okay, we're going to jump into the how. If someone new to Dory's data storytelling needed to present something, what should they start with? The data, the visualization, the story, Christian, you mentioned those as kind of the three elements, um, something else maybe that we haven't touched on yet. What's your roadmap for how someone should approach storytelling with data for FPNA, whether from a data science perspective or an FPNA perspective? And now let's start with you this time. Yeah, uh, data. You got to start with the data, right? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if, if you've got a story to tell, what are the details, right? What are the words, you know, leading up to, uh, you know, to the end? So yeah, you have to start with the data. Once you can kind of formulate, you know, and, and as accountants and finance professionals, again, like I said, we get lost in the weeds a lot, right? So we know the data. It's it's trying to pull out the story, I think is where, where most kind of stumble a little bit. And how do you explain that story? Speak like, and I always say, talk like a human, right? I, I don't talk to like you're talking to another finance professional. You really have to talk as though you're speaking to somebody who has never seen you know, a number in their life, right? So being able to really explain it on a level that again, that's, and again, it's that whole audience, right? You know, if, if you were to say, you know, to a junior accountant, well, you know, this is, this is the adjusted EBITDA, this is how it, you know, they're really going to look at you like, I have no idea what you're talking about unless they have experience, right? In, in looking at that stuff. But yes, you have to start with the data, formulate your story and then your visualization. Because if you start with that visualization before the story, you're going to edit and re-edit and re-edit until you get it right. Get your story and then have that visualization follow what you really want to share. Okay. So if I can paraphrase that, it's data and then story and then visualization. Jordan, what do you yeah. say? Do you agree with that order? Yeah. I mean, I think that like, from my standpoint, I would not start on anything until the data is done. So like, I'm assuming, let's assume that you have that done. It's like, well, where do I go now? Like the analysis is generally over. Maybe you have to do a little bit more as you go through it. I would say really the narrative to me is like, you know, I've written books. So like, maybe that's just the way I approach it. So um, my view is I love to outline things. I don't spend too much time, like in the details. I just get the high levels of it. And I just kind of visualize what am I going to plug here? What am I going to, am I going to plug here? And then once I'm done doing that, this part's very important. I think it's, it's so hard from everyone, like from authors to just people making presentations that less can be more. So go through and knock out everything, but the key point, even if it is painful, because you can always just save it and go back and see what it looks like when it's really down to its bare essentials. And then you can start adding back a little bit. And I think that that's what really makes a tight story, you know, and, and really don't worry about the details. You can speak to that when you're speaking, but to take a slide and put everything on it, um, your job is to tell the story, not be so afraid of the story that you have to present everything, right? So you need to get out in front and tell the story. So that's the way I like to do it. And I, that's the advice I give to get over the analysis paralysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I come from a journalism background and in journalism, we say, kill your darlings. <laughs> Because there's always stuff there that you like want to keep because oh but that's you know such a cool phrase or such a cool anecdote but you sure. can't keep it all i gotta kill your darlings christian what about you yeah so i agree, I agree with jordan and annette that you should start with the data uh, but i would take um even a step further back and really start to think about it like a scientist, right? Scientists, before they do anything, they have a hypothesis. So probably before you have to really dig into the data, you already have an idea, you've done some weekly tracking, you know where, you know, you know where the data is heading on a high level. So start with a hypothesis. So for example, let's say sales were 10% higher than expected in the last quarter, your job is to figure out why. You may have seen in your weekly tracking that coupon redemptions have been higher than usual recently. And so your hypothesis going into it is, could it be that higher discount rates are the main reason for higher sales? And then you dig into data. And the advantage of doing it this way is that you're be directed and you're less likely to, you know, as Jordan mentioned, run into analysis paralysis because you have a really clear goal. And then you keep working through your data until you hit a root cause. And that's where things often go a little bit uh, off. 
because um, higher revenues of product X, for example, is not a root cause, right? People need to dig deeper. And you also, by the way, need to have the right tools in place. So you can do that against a tight deadline and really go into, into the details with your ad hoc analysis. And let's say you keep digging and you find out, well, this new banner ad on our website converted more leads to paying customer for product X. So that's a root cause. Because, and, and how do you know that you found the root cause? It's because it suggests a clear action, right? If you say, well, revenues of product X are higher, you can't really do much with it. There's a lot you could do to drive revenue further. But if you say, well, it's this one ad, then you could, the action could be, well, I just show this ad to more customers. And that's also what enables you to do more than just sharing data in your story. You're actually sharing um, what the next step should be and what action to take. And it all comes down to the analysis. And only once that is complete, would I even touch PowerPoint? Because if you go there too early, you know, PowerPoint is patient, you just do a slide after the other. And then in the end, you think back, okay, why am I even saying this, right? What, what is the point I'm trying to tell? But by getting to the root cause first, from the hypothesis to a root cause, that's really how you can streamline the entire process. Thanks. Jordan and Nat, you want to just give like a quick response? Like, do you, what do you think about uh, looking for a hypothesis first? Does that help direct you or does it maybe bias you towards looking for a specific answer? What do you think? No, I mean, I think that like, uh, I think that that's spot on. I think I take it for granted. So, you know, I'm not like thinking that way, but um, it's definitely uh, a good point. You know, that's like, at the point at which you're about ready to present, you know, it's time to really start like honing in, like, what is it that we actually wanted to say here? And what were we testing? So I do, I love science. So I'm all, I'm all for that. I think that I just like, so I'm like already thinking I'm doing that. So I'm like, okay, I'm doing it right. So, um, but you know, like I, I just like um, probably take it for granted that that's something that does need to happen and people do need to hear it. Okay. Thanks. And that what about you. Yeah, no, I agree. I, I, I took that for granted too. And I'm like, I know there's a reason I'm looking at the data, right? That's, but yes, you're right. That is step one. Why, right? The why. Right. Yeah. I think, thanks for pointing that out, Christian. It's sort of this like underlying premise that is almost kind of take for granted, but it's helpful to bring that up. So, so people are thinking about that. Um, okay. I'm going to launch one last poll. Okay. The question is, what is the biggest obstacle to FPNA storytelling with data in your organization? Um, and as people are answering, I'm just gonna, someone has asked in the Q&A um, saying that you guys are, everyone's saying to keep it simple. So do you think, um, do you think it's enough to just have like one graph or like is a dashboard too complicated um, or can a dashboard also be simple? What do you guys think? I um, can, I can, I can take that. Um, so yes, it needs to be simple, but uh, not too simple, right? Because what you want to make sure with a story is that it needs to have a beginning, a middle and an end right, to tell a complete story. Maybe you want to say, okay, you're talking about this initiative, whether it worked for the company or not, this new innovation. Maybe we can start how the team had the idea originally, how they overcame obstacles to get there, you know, maybe they didn't have funding, they had to fight for it. And then you can see how over time this um, really came to, came to bear and uh, the company benefited from that. And your visualization ideally should also tell the entire story. It's a little bit of a fine line because you have to be really careful. It doesn't get too cluttered and you don't have too much on the slide. But um, by trying to think about, okay, am I, are, are readers able to see the beginning, a beginning, a middle and an end, you know, you could show that, for example, with a graph that has some of the history where the initiative didn't take place yet, some of the current um, trajectory and then and then the projection as well. You know, that's, for example, an example of how you can tell the entire story. OK, thanks. And Jordan, you wrote about dashboards for Excel for a whole book. So go ahead. <laughs> sure. So, I mean, I, I like I put this on LinkedIn, like probably last week, but I had a customer who asked me, he, he didn't really know what he wanted on a dashboard. So like he just needed to see like what was possible. So I put something together that I thought was like beautiful and was great. Sent it to him and he said, that's a great start. Let me show you what I built that's 
like taking it to the next level, which really was just a slicer, a pie chart and a table in, in Power BI. And so like, you know, um, that's all he wanted. That's all he needed. I could come back and say, Stephen Q says this and that, but that's what he wanted. So that's what he was going to interact with. Um, and that's the level where he was at. And like, I'm, I'm totally fine with that. I think that like the question here on whether dashboards are just a fashion and there's, they aren't the right way. I, I don't think that it's a good idea ever to just come up with like one blanket statement on that. You know, dashboards are a hype in the same way that so much in this space is. I mean, Pareto principle would say that most of it is in fact hype. So if we keep that in our minds, then the question before you is how to use this technology to effectively do the more abstract steps that Christian was saying, right? Beginning, middle, end of the story. Like whether you call that a dashboard or someone qualifies that as a dashboard or it's a sheet of paper or it's an Excel spreadsheet, like that really is more of a matter of implementation. You just need to make sure that you are telling the story effectively. And that's the most important part. Okay, thanks. So basically do what you need in order to tell the story is what I'm hearing. Yeah, and don't and don't focus on whether it's too much or too little. If that's not your frame, if that's not what you're into, and if that's not what your customers are into, then you need to meet them where they are. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like you're not competing with the enterprise industry. You're helping someone who needs help, you know? Right. Okay. And then I know you're gonna be talking about dashboards a little later. So I'm gonna I'm gonna leave off with you for now. Um, I'm gonna close the poll and share the results. Okay, so 38% of you said the biggest obstacle was collaboration with non-finance stakeholders that needed some work. 27% um, of you said the biggest obstacle was not having the technology you need. 21% said it's tough to get started. So I'm hoping that, you know, hearing some of this advice is going to help people get started if you've been having a hard time with that. And 14% of you said there is no major obstacle, uh, even if you might need some improvement. Okay, and now we're going to get to our last question for the panel. Okay. So what is the best piece of advice you can think of for someone who is new to data storytelling? What do you want them to remember? And that will start with you. Oh boy, that's a hard one. Somebody that's <laughs> new. Um, yeah, I know it's use, I mean, honestly, use, use somebody to really, you know, as a sounding board, right? If you're new to this, especially if you're new to this, because you don't want to get up in front of a room full of people with your, you know, with your presentation and it doesn't make any sense, right? Use a trusted, you know, coworker, somebody that you value their opinion and really just use them as a sounding board as you're getting started. Does this make sense, right? Because like I said, the last thing you want to do is put your name on something and, and it's not, you know, it, it's not effective. So, I you know, use those around you that have that have done it before, right? They they're going to have best practices, and Google is really your best friend. I, I really am going to say that, you know. Of course, as long as it's a good source, right? Don't use Wikipedia, but Google can be your best friend when it comes to show me showing you examples or you know different uh, you know different you know outlines as uh, as Jordan said, you know, and, and how to do it. So yeah, um, that and just like I said, you know use people in your circle for sure. And Annette, just to clarify, like, do you think people should be maybe asking people who are not in finance to look at it because of what you were saying before of, you know, someone, it's kind of different eyes, right? Like, is right. that something you and, would and recommend? I, and I had that, I mean, obviously in my career and it's been, you, you have to really show them that you know them, right? Whoever that audience is, you have to show them that you know them. And so, to understand, right, exactly what it is, number one, what they're looking at through their experience, through their eyes. Um, at, at one point in my career, I was actually a plant manager, right? I, I took a little took a little detour out of finance, but I understood the financial health of the, of the company. Being a plant manager, I really had to show all of the people on the shop floor that I knew them. I was out there every day learning their job, learning what they did so that I can have intelligent conversations. So show them that you know them, right? And and so that you know how to present to them. Okay, thanks. Christian, what about you? Yeah, so the advice I can give people who are new to storytelling is 
have generated multiple options, multiple alternatives at each stage of the process. You know, um, starting with analysis, always think about, is there different ways I could look at it? And, and don't just think about it, try it, you know, pull the data a different way, drill down differently and see what results it gives you. Then when you reach to the story stage, uh, don't just use your first idea that comes to mind and how you can tell it, try to force yourself to come up at least with five different ways and how you can tell the story because you will you will be surprised at you know maybe the third the fourth option that's really where your brain kicks into creative mode and you can get a much better um, outcome that you wouldn't have seen otherwise and then of course also very very important for visualizations you know you're your, uh, you know, Excel is your friend. You can you can try lots of different chart types. You know, don't just try one or two. Try three or four, and then take a step back. Maybe even wait a few hours or a day if you can. Look at it. Look at your different options, and with a with a fresh eye, uh, choose the one that really speaks to you the most. So that's really my my the advice I can give people is generate several options at every step along the way. Mm -hmm. Okay, so try a lot of things. And also, you mentioned putting your brain into creative mode. And I think that's something interesting, because I feel like a lot of times in finance, you're looking at the data, you're not in creative mode at all, necessarily, right? You're in numbers mode. Um, and this is sort of switching gears a little bit, like, from the data that's in front of you to the create creativity of how to tell that story. Jordan, what about you? Um, you know, I think that these are both great responses, uh, definitely things I agree with and have done. Obviously, I think that this is one of the major analysis paralysis aspects. People come to me after a presentation, well, how do I make the perfect data visualization? And I say, you don't, you know, everything's a trade-off. Just make several of them, uh, get feedback, take the feedback well. Um, there's a few other things, though, and this is going to be a shameless plug uh, for my last book. If you're doing more data science stuff, like in becoming a data head, Alex and I practiced explaining stuff to each other for 10 years before we wrote the book, but we spent a lot of time with these tough concepts because we felt like people weren't explaining them well. So we really spent like these years, we'd call each other up, what do you think about this explanation? Um, and so we put them all in the book if you want to borrow them and use them if you have to explain stuff for people. But fundamentally, I mean, we went through this for a while, really just like trying to test out, is this a good way to explain it? And then I meet other people um, and I'd say, what do you think about this? Like in our explanation and they have different, they would add on to it. And so you, we really let it evolve from the first few years. And that like allowed us to really hone in on like, what is it that people need and what is it that they wanna hear? Um, and in particular, just one last thought on this. Remember with finance, um, if you were speaking to a non-finance person, they don't care, all right? They don't, they're not here for your ego. Like they are not more is more, they don't want to hear that. Like you need to come at the level that they're going to shut off because of the cognitive strain. So like throw your ego out. Like they're not here to validate you and like get to what it is they need to hear to make a decision. And that might be you more listening than talking, you know? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. I feel like in sales, they frame it a little bit differently. It's like, what's in it for me? You know? Uh, but it's the same idea. Like put yourself in the other person's shoes and how do you explain it in a way that really brings it home to the other person? Yeah, okay. I think like in finance in particular, like talking to a non-finance person, because I talk to the creatives here in New York all the time and they're just like, no, don't talk to me about finance. <laughs> so it, it will take like a little something extra to get them to listen, you know? Yeah, okay, thanks. Um, Thank you guys so much for your answers. Um, and now Annette's going to take just a few minutes to show us how to implement some of these data visualization practices that we've been talking about. And then after that, we'll have a few minutes left for Q&A with the panel. Um, uh, and I'll be adding into the chat some details for how to get a personalized demonstration if you'd like to learn more, um, as well as information about uh, Christian's next FPNA bootcamp. Um, so Annette, go for it. Hey, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to share my screen with everybody. And what I'm really going to show today is how data rails, you know, uh, imagine that, can actually leverage, right, data visualization how we can really leverage, um, you know, those dashboards. And so I think there was a, I think I was reading a comment in here somewhere about, you know, how about like one chart or one report? Couldn't that tell a whole story? Um, and I'm going to say that depends. 
what is the story you're trying to tell, right? If you just want to show monthly revenues, it, maybe this is the only visualization you need, right? Because that's really all you're telling. But if you want to show the financials, for instance, right, we can show, right, your actual financial statement along with a lot of different visualizations. So this is a dashboard um, for financials, obviously. We've got our P&L. We've got some revenue analysis, um, you know, EBITDA. We've got, you know, obviously some, um, some, some metrics in here, cash flow, OPEX, right? Yes, this is a very huge um, dashboard because we use this for our demo purposes. So we want to make sure that we show everybody everything um, that's really possible, right? But to your point, can this be its own dashboard working capital? Absolutely. And this is what somebody's going to look at, right? So what does this show you, right? We're going to see all of, you know, our actuals, what are our current assets, you know, what's our working capital, our current ratio. And then we can graph that out to show trends over time, right? This is going to give you a lot more information than say, you know, if we're just going to show what it is this month or this week or this day, right? Being able to show trends because as we know, history usually, usually predicts the future. So being able to represent that um, and, and you'll be able to see, of course, where maybe there are some big hiccups in your data. And that's where that kind of gives you that narrow, it, you can narrow in to whatever those details are to really see what were the drivers. In data rails, this stuff is super easy. You don't need to learn DAX. I know Power BI, um, and you know, and I know I, I used the camera feature in Excel for many, many, many years before I had dashboard capability because you are so confined in Excel to row and column width and height. And so using that camera, I could actually create all of these charts in separate tabs, bring it all into one summary. But with something like data rails, a tool like data rails, creating these charts are going to be incredibly easy. Um, again, you know, we can show budgets, actuals, we can show variance and tools like this, we can even do variance analysis straight from a dashboard. So it's more than just a visualization of a point in time. It can be drillable, right? It doesn't have to be static. We can drill into our data. And just to give you an idea, ease of use. And again, I know that there are a lot of tools out there drag and drop, what you see is what you get, right? Any of the fields available in your data, you can drag it, create filters, et cetera. You've got your visualization, it's all created. You're gonna hit save. Everybody you know, that has access to this, they're gonna be able to drill into your data, change it around however they want. Now, this is a manufacturer, or a financial. Um, so what about other types of metrics? Production for instance, right? This isn't really coming from your general ledger, right? Maybe you want to show high level KPIs like yield or output. That for a, you know, an operations manager is gonna make a lot more sense than showing the weekly financials or the monthly financials to them. This is really, again, that audience, this is what they wanna see. They wanna know what their daily yield is or maybe their production or where is, you know, the scrap dollars are being showed. So something as, as simple as this is really going to give some insights into like an operations manager. They're not going to, you know, want to see what they, what we spent on legal fees or, um, you know, what our, uh, you know, our SG&A costs are. This is really what matters to them. Having a dashboard for a specific group of people. In addition, right, maybe HR. Of course, they're interested in headcount, salaries. You can have dashboards specific to departments, to even to managers, right? Knowing that audience, I think was probably like my number one takeaway in my entire career, because you can show the same exact data in multiple different ways, depending on who you're reporting out to. This is always my favorite PowerPoint. Yeah, everybody's got PowerPoint, but can you do it in a live dashboard? We can. <laughs> PowerPoint. Publish that bad boy as a dashboard, right? Still have that capability of that live drill down capability, right? Right from within what quote unquote looks like PowerPoint. Because really you're gonna be creating that in native PowerPoint, just publish it to a dashboard. Now anybody can use it. So just one of the, one of the many magic tricks we have up our sleeves. That's my, that's my dashboarding 101. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much you for that, Anna. You want to know more, you're going to have to email me. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, thanks for that, Annette. And I've put uh, in the chat, if you want a more personalized demo, um, you can go to datarails.com and request a demo. Um, and we have time for a few more questions. Um, I actually saw one specifically to Jordan. Uh, someone wants to know, are you thinking of updating advanced Excel essentials and dashboards for Excel? Um, probably not. You know, the, the updated version of that is my advanced Excel.com uh, course. So I just kind of took the new the stuff that I like and I put it into an online course. So it's um, so, yeah, if you're interested in that material, it'd be advanced Excel.com. Uh, but I think the person who asked that, in fact, actually has access to that because <laughs> I, I know that person. So, um, yeah, uh, that's kind of that's probably where I'm at with it. I think, uh, I, you know, I do think um, Excel hasn't reached its total limit. There are new things that their capabilities are being built. But I do think that like products like data rails do, do help you get like once you hit that limit, um, they do help you. And also Power BI. Obviously, I'm not trying to compare them, but like, um, you know, I think that those, those things are, are really the future and that Excel dashboards are great, but they can't solve everything anymore. And they should not. If they ever should have, they did because that was the option. So um, that's kind of my, my thinking on that. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, okay, and Annette talked about using non-strictly finance data um, as part of kind of like the fp &A role of understanding everything that's happening in the business. Um, and I wanted to hear a bit from Christian and Jordan, what do you think, like what's the importance of kind of looking outside the revenues and sort of your, your basic p and and stuff like that? Yeah, I'm happy to take that. So I think it's very, very important that finance teams don't feel limited to data that has a dollar sign attached to it. You know, there was kind of the old view. Some companies are still a bit siloed where, you know, the finance team only gets the finance data and kind of the operational data sits with other teams. But I'm a big proponent of um, data democracy, right? So that data within a company should be shared across all teams. And I think finance and FP&A teams are especially equipped to make use of that non-financial data, you know, by connecting the dots between, okay, what are our inventory levels doing? How is headcount trending? You know, what are uh, so what are our views on our comp online store doing? And how does that potentially translate then, of course, into dollars in the end? But taking the holistic view of data, modeling everything, bringing everything together into one database or one table, that I think can unlock things that you that you just can't see otherwise. Thanks, Jordan. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, I you know anything could be a model driver. It doesn't mean all things should be, but it would be silly to not include those things because you know once they already have a dollar sign, it's already been modeled. Someone's already assigned value to it. And there may be some way in which you're going to use the base data. I mean, this is really, as, as Christian was saying, going back to the root cause, it's going to require you to step, you know, before the financial statements, how do we even get to these numbers? Um, so I'm a big proponent of that. I, I've always thought it was interesting when I've done training, they say, oh, well, we can't show Power BI or this or that to the accountants yet because they'll freak out. It's like, well, I don't know that they will, like, we'll just show them how to use it. I don't know why there's this sort of... Um, thinking around different departments, but then this is why I work for myself. So <laughs> like, I don't have a good response to that, except that I just think it's kind of silly um, to have these preconceived notions. Okay, and I'm seeing people ask about different uh, dashboarding tools like uh, Excel versus, you know, Power BI or Data Rails or, you know, Tableau, whatever. Like, what? why would you prefer kind of a dashboarding tool versus just doing it in Excel, Jordan? Um, you know, the, the, uh, short answer to that is that it doesn't matter, or maybe that's the long answer. It really, <laughs> it doesn't matter. I mean, Excel, you most likely have access to, and you can start practicing right away. Fundamentally, like Tableau and Power BI are sim very similar, you know, data rails, I wouldn't say is exactly like, like that, but it solves a lot of the workflow problems. I would say that you really want to focus on what's your workflow. Like, am I putting this in a presentation? Can I just show someone an Excel sheet and let that dictate the technology that you would like to use, but also keep an open mind that you can operate between all of them. I mean, they're very similar. I don't know why we have to pick one, you know? Yeah. Uh, Christian, what about you? Yeah, for me, it all comes down to speed in the end, right? Because you want to minimize the time on non-valuating activities like collecting your data, cleaning your data, preparing your data, you know, putting it into the spreadsheet. So you need to use the tool that allows you to ideally get that data preparation time down to zero. So you can go immediately into analysis 
and really go deep into how can you get insights from that and uncover risk and opportunities. That's why you want to spend your time on. And that I think should be your, your guide to deciding what the right tool is uh, for you. Okay, thanks. Annette? Yeah, same. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, and, you know, and I've used a lot of tools over over the years and and I think I'm a lot like like Jordan really in that, you know, I'm very much self-taught in Excel. I can write VBA, I can write SQL, I can write, you know, because I had to get to the answers so quickly, I had to find new and easier ways to do that, to get that data into Excel. Right? So, yes, you can absolutely still use Excel. There's nothing wrong with Excel. Millions of people use it every day. I mean, I, I, I'm actually on a, on a board of directors for a children's theater, right, just outside Chicago in Illinois here. And for a long time, all of our, um, like, like our advertising, all of, the, all of the design work I did, I did it in Excel because that's the tool I knew. I didn't know how to use, you know, any kind of photo editing, whatever. I used Excel for pretty much everything, right? So I'm probably one of those outliers that, uh, and I think I, I still kind of use it today for a little bit of everything. I hate word. Um, but to that point, right, it's still, it's very usable. We use it every day. Use it until maybe it becomes unmanageable. And that's when you need to start looking at, I've kind of hit the limit on my Excel, um, you know, and usually you know that when it continues to crash on you because your file sizes are so big and you can't, you, you, <laughs> Jordan's laughing because he knows exactly what I'm talking about, right? They're so big now because what started out as maybe an ad hoc report grew and grew and grew. And now it's this huge albatross. And you don't even remember how you started it. You just know that you kept building onto it. Well, now it's not usable anymore. That's your clue that maybe you need another tool to kind of help you automate those processes. Yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Um you guys have been awesome. This is it has been great, uh, you know, talking to you about using data to tell a story. Um, and I really want to thank everyone who has joined us. Um, thanks for coming. Anyone have any last words, Christian, Jordan, and that any one last thing that you really want everyone to just remember? Uh, sure. I just think, you know, we live in interesting times right now. So like, if this is something you want to do, if you want to get into fp &A, if you want to increase your storytelling, all of that, you know, I know Christian has a, has a course, um, you know, I have courses and stuff, whatever. I'm not here to like pump anything up, but like, I guess what I want to say is this is a time to invest in yourself. And, uh, I think that like, this is that this is what people should be doing. So if you've thought about it, you know, this is the time to make a move and I wish everyone luck on their, you know, learning journeys. Awesome. Any other last words, Christian and Nat? I, I just have to say, I love Jordan's t-shirt. <laughs> yes, actually, someone in the Q&A commented on your t-shirt. Center, love it, love it. He excels, I love it. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for everyone to staying with us and listening to us talking about data for an entire hour. You know, there's uh, <laughs> something to that. So thanks so much for, for being here. I think what it means yes, is, you. uh, Jordan, you've got a lot of data heads here. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you, everybody.